All right, let's get into God's Word. Um, I'm just going to pray again because that's really just thrown me a bit. Father, um, Lord, we want to get back into your presence now. We, we uh, want to get into your Word and under your Word and be uh, submerged in your Word. And for us to understand your Word, we need the illumination of your Spirit. Holy Spirit, please would you minister to us, move amongst us, and open up our minds and hearts. I feel already that there's a connection through the hymns and the prayers with what's going to be said. So please, Lord, let it be nothing of me. I just bring myself afresh um, on the altar, and that, Lord, you would use me as your vessel to bless the saints. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so our title for this sermon is the tale of two sons the tale of two sons now if you have children you will know the joys and the challenges of being a parent you'll know what parenthood means if you've got grown-up children you'll maybe know what it means to be a grandparent and you know I was thinking that uh, during this restriction on our, our, our movement, uh, being at home, those of us who are with families, um, it's a great time, isn't it, to be able to spend time with your family and to buy out time, especially if you're not working, to be able to bond and do things that you, you've wanted to do and maybe only can get the chance to do when it's holidays. And yet, the opportunity to use time wisely, to be together as families, is not actually working out how you would expect. I looked at one uh, national poll, uh, one charity actually, uh, the National Domestic Abuse Helpline, that said they'd seen a 25% increase in calls and online requests for help since the lockdown. So actually, what you would expect to be better is actually, uh, for some, being much worse. And it is really what King Solomon said. He said there's nothing new under the sun, a prophetic statement about life in general. It's a statement of uh, sin, really, that is in uh, mankind, that, that there's nothing new under the sun, and this type of behavior is the same. And you know, the Bible speaks a lot about families, a lot about relationships, a lot about children. And some of those narratives portray joy and happiness and victories and so forth but there's often um, in the Bible a, a candidness about relationships and a candidness about failures within relationships and tragedies and broken families and you probably can think when I say the tale of two sons you probably can think back to to Genesis and the tale or rather the narrative of Cain and Abel um, and their relationship, or maybe Isaac and Ishmael and their relationship, Jacob and Esau, um, uh, Amnon and Absalom, uh, the sons of King David, and each family had a crisis, each family had something that, that broke down. And so I want to look at a parable today, it's a well-known parable, but in hope, God willing, um, it's going to come from a slightly different angle. And is it the tale of two sons in the parable this, in the New Testament um, of the prodigal son? And really, it should be sons, not son. It is actually a story of two sons, or two types of people, who were both equally lost, but from different perspectives. Each son also had a desire to have a meaningful relationship with their father. And we'll just go through this parable together. And to understand the parable, we need to take off our, uh, what we call Greco-Roman glasses. That is the way we understand the world through our particular culture. Step back in time and then put on our uh, Hebraic or Jewish glasses and understand what's going on back in the first century, what Jesus is trying to teach his audience, um, and how he employs what is actually Jewish um, family laws of inheritance to make a, a statement um, about relationships. 
So let's have a look at this parable together. A parable is, is simply a story that teaches a, a moral um, or spiritual lesson. So we're going to turn to Luke chapter 15, if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 and we're going to pick up from verse 11 and read through to the end of the chapter. So here's Jesus and he's teaching uh, parables. Uh, he's got a crowd listening in, Pharisees listening in. And this is what he says in verse 11. He said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me and so he divided his wealth between them not many days later the younger son gathered everything together and he went on a journey into a distant land and there he squandered his estate with loose living now when he had spent everything a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses he said how many of my father's hired men have more than enough to eat but I am dying here and hungry. I will get up, I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And so he got up and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him and he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him and the son said to him father I have sinned against heaven and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son but the father said to his slaves quickly quickly bring out the best robe put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and let us celebrate for this son of mine was dead and he has come to life again he was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate now his older son was in the field and when he came and he approached the house he heard the music and the dancing and he summoned one of the servants began inquiring what these things could be and he said to him your brother has come home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and he was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. And he answered and said to his father, Look, so many years have I been serving you. I've never neglected a command of yours. And yet you've never given me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his son, when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. He said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate. We had to rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and has been found. Well, it is an incredible parable. It's well known, but as you read through it, it's so powerful. The parable dramatizes this crisis in a family of this particular family. Personal relationships that have been shattered by the action and the inaction of two sons. 
Notice in verse 11 and verse 12, we're going to exegete this now. We're going to go through it. We're going to draw out the meaning and make application. Jesus told this parable, verse 11, a man had two sons. So you have this man with two sons. And in verse 12, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. All right, so there's the request. How often is it that a close-knit family can fall apart when someone dies and the will is read? <laughs> How many times does that happen? Uh, uh, you know, suddenly people start behaving irrationally and, and it's greed. And here's this young lad, this younger son, who requests ahead of time the inheritance of of his father now what is that what does that amount to i mean if you go to your parent and you say well can i have the inheritance before you die you know it is really tantamount to wishing that they were dead i mean that's what you're saying you're saying you know i'd like the money so you know could you move out the way it's tantamount to saying well, drop dead, I want your money. It, it is so greedy, so selfish. And people do say that. I've heard it even recently, where um, a, 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 a sibling, a, a daughter, no, a, a son had made that request. And it is wrong. Now, according to Jewish law, this is in the um, Mishnaic law, a father could execute his will before his death so this isn't made up this could happen and his listeners jesus listeners would understand that however even when the father discharged it and gave the inheritance he still retained uh, a certain amount of control over the son's property until he actually died okay so that's how it was in the first century for example, the son couldn't legally sell off the land, even though he'd inherited it, not until the father had died. But what happens here, if you read carefully at the end of verse 12, it says that the father divided his wealth between both of the sons. Do you see that? Both of the sons. So although it was the younger son who initiated the request, the elder son also received. The inheritance was divided between them. Now, according to Deuteronomy 21, 17, that would mean the elder son would actually receive the most. He would receive double portion, two-thirds of the family's wealth, while the younger son would only receive one-third. And I think that's an important point to stress right at the beginning. Now, actually, the eldest son really should have spoken up for his father. The eldest son should not have just gone along with this and thought, ah, okay, I'll have my inheritance as well. He should have spoken up and demanded that his younger brother apologize to his father and that they should both together wait for the inheritance. Really, whatever the problem was with the son, the youngest son, there should have been a, a course of action that would bring reconciliation, that there would be a goal in... Um, stopping this greed from escalating that they should wait so understand that both received their inheritance okay so what does the younger son do well verse 13 not many days later the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country and there he squandered his estate with loose living. The younger son is a rebel. He is a rebel to the core. He is selfish. And he did what was right in his own eyes. Just like at the end of the book of Judges. They were doing what was right in their own eyes. And he wanted the money. He had no consideration for his father. For his brother. He no doubt liquidated whatever assets he did get. Although if it was property, he wouldn't be able to. But he, he got his inheritance somehow so that he could transfer it into cash. And off he goes to live out the dream. I mean, how many children do that? How many young people do that? 
you know, that they're not happy at home uh, for whatever reason. And it is really selfishness. And they want to go and see the world. And how many, um, how many midlife crises with, with people as they were? Oh, I wish I'd done this when I was younger. And I wish I'd done that. And uh, it's just selfishness. It's actually not being content with what you have. And this young lad was not. His, his eyes, his dream was to travel off to faraway lands and to just live the dream. Far away from his family so they couldn't see what was going on. And so in doing so, in taking this action, the younger son rejects and, re and defiles the love of his father. You know, he's rejecting his love. What does he do with all that money? Well, it says he squanders it. He wastes it. He lives that playboy life until everything's spent up. How many do that? I mean, you see it when celebrities suddenly come into money or somebody wins the lottery and they waste it. They just go crazy and waste the money. And that's what this young man did. In verse 14 it says, Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. You know, a friend said to me that when they ever receive, this couple actually, say whenever they receive money unexpectedly, then they always know that the Lord's given it because there's a bill coming round the corner. You know, in other words, that they handle money wisely and they, they know that when money comes, then it's not just to be frittered away. And money, as we know, in of itself is not bad. It's not wrong to have a good job. It's not wrong to earn money. It is a necessary evil in this world. But we know scripture teaches it's how we handle money and it's if we love money. It's if we're um, chasing after money or pleasure which goes along with money and this is what this lad did he he loved pleasure and and really that reflects a lack of inner contentment with this young man he wasn't content with his life he wasn't content with where his life was leading and so many um, throughout history and especially in our age are living lives that are meaningless they're chasing the dream they're being told to achieve this and achieve that, which is not a bad thing in itself, but there's still at the end of it no hope. And this lad had no hope, and he had squandered everything. And it says there that once it was all gone, then a famine came, a severe famine came. You know, it is a riches to rags story. It's the opposite. He doesn't become rich. It's the opposite. He loses everything. So the famine comes upon the whole country and, and reduces him to poverty. And it, it doesn't go into detail, but, um, you know, poverty, it, it talks in a bit about him um, not having anything. And, you know, I, I see him completely homeless, penniless, um, out on the streets. Um, that's where this had taken him. This, this, this selfishness had taken him. But what is interesting now, as we read in verse 14, that this which comes upon him now begins a journey for this young man. And it is a journey back to the Father. It is a journey back to the Father. You know, he's, he's run away from home, but now begins the journey back to restoration back from the physical to the spiritual because it is the spiritual that will fulfill us nothing else will fulfill us it is only the spiritual it is the same journey that many of us have experienced it's that journey out of Egypt it's that journey out of of who we were sometimes it's hard to think back to who we were to remind ourselves of just where we were really in the pit until the Lord uh, took us out. And this is where he's at. And you know, sometimes 
it requires the Lord to get our attention to take us to places of brokenness, to take us to a place of hopelessness, to take us a place where we cry out to him. And here God has taken everything away to get his attention through this famine and through his own misuse. But only now does he begin this story, this, 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 this road to reconciliation. And God will do that with any one of us. And sometimes to get our attention, he puts us on a sickbed. Sometimes to get our attention, bad things happen. You say, oh, no, 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 God, God's a God of love. He is, but sometimes he disciplines us. It's there in Scripture. Sometimes he has to just take a hold of us and um, bring us to a place of repentance because that, without that we, we live a lie and without that we live um, out of fellowship with God. We, we can, even as a believer, be out of fellowship. So here he is, and... In verse 15, it reads, So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. I want you to think about this, because unless you know the, the Jewish kosher laws, unless you understand the historical setting, you won't really get how bad this is. Here we have a Jewish lad who has left his homeland. He's moved into clearly a Gentile territory or country. He's wasted his inheritance from his father. And now he finds himself seeking work from a Gentile. And where does this heartless Gentile send him? Knowing full well, no doubt, that he's Jewish. Where does he send him? Well, he sends him into his fields to look after sheep. No. No. To look after swine, pigs. There could be nothing more offensive than him having to go and herd and care for pigs because they are an unclean animal under the law. And yet he's tending to pigs. And now Jesus, remember, Jesus is telling this parable and he has a Jewish audience and they would be shocked as well. They would be, wow, what, what is this? <laughs> you know, they would, it would be repugnant to them to think that this boy had gone so low that he was willing to go and work with swine. And of course, here in this verse, there's no benevolence from the actual Gentile. Um, actually, there's a sense here of anti-Semitism. Um, perhaps even for Jesus' audience in the first century, there would be hints um, coming through to them because they themselves at that time were under the yoke of Rome and uh, they'd lost their national sovereignty and that meant that they'd lost their dignity in a way and here was this lad who also had lost his dignity to a Gentile and so there's more to it, there's more going on so verse 16 he says he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods of pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. Here he was, so destitute, and, and remember he's working, and yet he's working, but he still cannot feed himself on whatever he's being paid. I mean, there are people even today who work 40 hours and, and can't, feed themselves because the wage is so low it is still going on but here he is cannot feed himself you get the sense that he's actually starving and he desires to eat these pods that are given to the swine uh, your bible some of your bibles may say pods of the carob tree and this is um the food for the destitute i mean this is the lowest of the lowest food this is you, humans don't eat this um, unless they're absolutely desperate. But he wanted to fill his stomach with these pods. That's how hungry he was. And it says there in the verse as well that no one was giving him anything. 
whether that was to do with his Jewishness or the state of the famine, but no one was helping him. You know, I was listening to um, homeless people talking about their experience on the streets, and uh, one was saying that it, it's like it's like watching another world as people walk past one after another after another, and you're just looking on as they just walk past you as if you're not even there. And this is how they were to this this young lad. No one was helping. No one was interested. But all of this the Lord was using to draw in this parable this boy back. I thought it was interesting today um, on this uh, did documentary that I was watching on on homelessness they asked this one uh, guy who was on the streets in in America they said to him if you had a ma if you had a, a wish you know a magic wish and you could you could just have anything you wanted what would you ask for you know and you might think well wealth and money and you know but he didn't ask for that do you know what he asked for he said I would ask for my family back that's what he said for my family back. He said I'd ask for my grandparents to be back who had died. And whatever this guy's journey, that's what he longed for was family, to be in a family. And this is what is beginning to take place in the heart of this young man. Now no doubt there were those that were pointing the finger and saying, well, you know, those who knew him, wagging the finger, pointing the finger, well he deserves what he gets. You know, that's what happens when you sin. That's what happens when you turn away from God. And in some sense, it's true. We pay for our, the consequences, the choices we make. It, it's true. But often the people who wag the finger are the self-righteous ones, aren't they? Just as in Jesus' day, how the Pharisees would wag their finger. You know, you haven't washed up to the elbow and you haven't done this and you haven't done that. No grace. It's interesting that the rabbis of the time, um, they, they did teach that poverty could lead a person to recognize their need for God. Um, that is true. So even, the, even what Jesus was teaching was, was um, understood. But, you know, with the Pharisees, they would prefer that the sinner stayed in the pig pen. Yeah, um, because it just made them feel better. So the son has left home he he had felt exuberant he felt liberated he felt unshackled he, and he was longing for more freedom he took his money and now here he is found in servitude in bondage far away worse than anything that he would have experienced at home so what does he do well what happens next verse 17 when he came to his senses, now that is such an important phrase to grab hold of and underline. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger? This is where the Lord, as he draws him through this experience, begins to break through, and this lad begins to have an epiphany an awakening in his desperate plight he's shaken I mean that's my prayer for COVID-19 that people will be shaken they'll be, they'll be awakened from their apathy you know made to wake up and look and say what's it all about why am I here where's it all going and this is what begins to happen with this lad and he thinks back to his life at home and he thinks back to how good it was. And he had left because no doubt he thought of how, how restrictive it was and how, how bad it was. You know, I've got to do this and that. I want freedom. But this is a turning point. This self-assured, cocky son now recognizes his dire mistakes. And he sees himself as he really is. And what is he? He is the same as you and me. A sinner. You know, we're all in the same boat, whichever road's been taken. A sinner, a lost sinner, 
in need of a father's love and a father's forgiveness. That was the epiphany. That's what he realized he needed. The phrase he came to his senses is actually a Hebrew, Hebrewism, Hebraism for repentance. It means he repented. That was the breakthrough. He repented. How many, I wonder, have children who they've raised as believers, who, who have gone off, who have just gone astray. How we pray that they will come to their senses. Maybe COVID-19 is the way. Maybe this will bring many who have backslidden, many who have never come to faith, bring them to this place of repentance where they come to their senses. But the first step here, it involves this realistic understanding of who God is and who we are in relation to him. We are sinners and he is holy. We are there and he is here. And once that penny drops, once you realize who you are before a holy God, you suddenly understand what sin is. It isn't just a term it, it is it is it is everything about us it is and it needs that revelation that holy spirit revelation of who we are and he experienced that moment he came to his senses let's move on to verse 18 Now, just before we do, notice that in that last verse, that when he came to his senses, he, he recognized that if he went back, you know, the, the, the hired men, those who served his father in his father's house, they had plenty of bread, that they were not going hungry. Uh, I know the whole thing together just spurred him on. And so in verse 18 and verse 19, he said to himself, I will get up, I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. This is, these are two profound verses. He repents in the previous verse. He reflects upon where his journey has brought him. And now he realizes, I need to go home. I need to go back to my father. And not only that, he recognized that he had to repent to his father. And so he makes this plan. He makes this plan that he will go back and this is what he's going to say. And by the way, this is not deceitfulness. This is not simply to feed his belly. There's more going on. It isn't just going back to, to obtain uh, food or possessions or more money something else has happened he really does have a contrite heart he really is feeling shame and embarrassment he really does understand that he sinned against his earthly father and against his heavenly father that term I've sinned against heaven is is in reference to God Almighty it's a um, what do they call it um, circumlocation I think they call it in other words he replaces God the name God with heaven but that's who he's on about that's who he means and so he has this repentance and he desires to put things right but notice that this younger son has no expectation that the father will take him back as a son in fact he's quite happy to be placed among the hired men and actually give up the right to be a son he said I'll go back and I'll be as if I'm not a son but I'll go back because I need to I need to get this put right and so there's a sense also here in the son of, of worthlessness you see it's one thing to recognize our sin it's one thing to know that we need forgiveness but to feel worthless is, is that step too far because in God's sight we're not worthless 
And worthlessness, that sense of worthlessness, feeling worse, worthless, can, can hinder our walk with God tremendously, even after we're saved. It's, it's a hindrance. And so he has a sense of that. There's a sense of that in this. All right, verse 20. So he got up and he came to his father. All right, so he makes the journey home. A long way. He's on his way home. And then it says there in that same verse, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and sent him away. Sent a messenger to say, stay away. When his father saw him, he felt compassion. He ran and embraced him and kissed him. Isn't that a beautiful picture of a father's love? A father's grace and forgiveness? The father has no idea why the son has returned. He doesn't know if he's coming for more money. He has no idea. But what the father does know is that the son initiated the return. That the son is here by his own volition. And so while he's a long way off, his father sees him. His father, you get the sense that he's been longing to see his son for so long. That he's missed his son. You know, a bit like if, if a, a child moves to Australia or New Zealand. We've got all the technology to see them, but we can't embrace them. We can't kiss them. And here we have, as the son returns home, still away from the house, the father goes out to meet him. There's this meeting together, this coming together of the father and the son. You know, and just as I think about it, it's a beautiful picture of salvation. The way that the Holy Spirit draws a person. And then how the Holy Spirit draws the person to that place where there's this sort of mysterious symbiosis in the person experiences um, salvation you know it, it, it's a beautiful picture of how the father reaches out but also how the person themselves are being drawn to that meeting of the divine I don't know what you think about that word compassion but I just in, in, the, in the Greek it, it's just to experience great affection and just to be overwhelmed for someone and this is how he felt for his son. And he runs to him. And as I said, there was no suspicion here. No, no criticism of the son. No, no idea that his son had repented. Just mercy and grace towards him. And what did he do when he, when he met him? He just embraces him. He kisses him. And uh, the ancient Near East and people on the continent, you know, they, they, they're very demonstrative. They embrace. They're not... Like us British standoffish, they embrace, they kiss. I remember meeting a, a, a guy from from actually Italy and uh, never met him before, and he grabs hold of me and he kisses me on that cheek and kisses me on that cheek. And it's just affection, and this is what this father does. And by the way, he ran to him, which actually is not dignified for a man of wealth. You know, he'd have to. They, they wore long garments. He'd have had to lifted it up, um, sort of girded it around him, and, and ran. Um, but he didn't care. He wanted to embrace his son. He saw him coming. And no doubt that's a longing that he had for, for years. So what's the response then of the son? Well, in verse 21, he repeats that well-rehearsed apology. He knows what he wants to say to his father. And so he says... There in verse uh, 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He is so overwhelmed. He's so distraught and so... He just feels completely unworthy of his father's attention and his father's love. That's where this journey has brought him. 
And yet the father's response is not to say, well, where have you been? And, you know, what have you done with the money? Or why do you look like that? Or it wasn't to question or criticize. I believe that as the father heard him say, I'd, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, that, that was just what the father needed to hear because it was repentance. It was acknowledgement that he's done wrong. But it also must have really felt like a knife in the heart to say, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So the repentance comes. The father now has an inkling that his son has changed. And the father said to the slaves in verse 22, Quickly bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet. The best robe. The best robe would, is, would have been his own robe, the father's robe. He brought the best robe out, the servants, wrapped it around the sun. He brought out a ring, a signet ring. It would have been a symbol of reinstatement into the family. You know, it's a symbol of your home. Sandals, no doubt he had nothing on his feet. Slaves, penniless, no, nothing on his feet. And they bring him out sandals. In verse 23 it says, He said to the servants, Bring the fattened calf, kill it, let us eat, let us celebrate. A fattened calf, a calf that's been kept for a special occasion, just being fed up <laughs> and, and made ready for a special occasion, normally for a wedding or something like that. But here it was used to celebrate the return of the sun. And by the way, it wouldn't just have been um, a family affair. This was a celebration for the whole village, you know, the whole, the whole vicinity. I mean, this was a big deal and this was a, a big celebration. So the father here, in his response, is not just clothing his son, not just giving him physical things, but showing him honour and acceptance. And, and that's what Father God does. When we come to know him, he, he, he accepts us. He clothes us in his righteousness. He seals us unto eternity. A, a beautiful picture of salvation itself as the Father gives us everything we need and takes us into his home. Why? Why is the, why is the Father so elated? Well, verse 24. For this son of mine was dead and he's come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. My son, my son, expressing the Father's love. My son, he was dead. He was as good as dead. He was lost. He was away from the family. He was away from the Father. He was out of fellowship. He was dead. And you know, before we come to faith, we are dead. We are spiritually dead. We are walking in our transgression and sin until finally we come to know him. Out there, the unsaved are walking dead. It sounds strange to say, but it's true. Those who are not born again into the family of God are dead in their sins and trespasses. And here he was. This son of mine was dead, but has come to life again. And it's a recognition now of, of that repentance and that coming back to the Father, coming back to life. He was lost and has been found. You know, and what does the scripture say? We're all like sheep, you know, that, that, that wander off. We're all, we're all like lost sheep. 
Um, but the Father wants to bring us home. He wants to bring us into his family. And you know, when there's one sinner that's saved, what happens in heaven? The whole heaven rejoices. And this is what happens. They all come together to celebrate. And in a way, it's like a resurrection of the Son. It's like he died to the Father, but now he's reborn, resurrected, raised up. The Son couldn't find meaning in the life that he went off to find. Hence he was lost. But now he is found as he returns back with, a, with new insight. And the Father has no option but to celebrate. You would, wouldn't you? You would have to celebrate because what's actually happened here is a miracle. Salvation is a miracle. It is a sovereign act of God and it is a miraculous and awesome thing. And not to be taken for granted. Alright, so now we're going to shift to the elder son. Now, how, how is he going to respond? Well, in verse 25, we'll read to 25 through to 27. The older son was in the field. When he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He summoned one of the servants, began inquiring what these things could be. He said to him, Your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. So what does the son do? Well, I'm so happy. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to rush up there and celebrate. I'm going to hug him and kiss him. and I've missed my brother. No. First of all, this elder son is out working in the field that's a contrast with this younger son who's been out, out wasting everything and, and, and hasn't been working um, until the till the end of that uh, journey you know so you've got the older son working hard coming home from working hard and he, and he hears this music and dancing away from home wondering who it's for and it's for this this brother of his I mean he was shocked it was his worst nightmare that this good for nothing brother had come home that's how he felt and this anger and envy begin to began to grow within him as he heard that they've killed the fattened calf he maybe thought well that fattened calf was for my wedding I, I don't know do you know what I mean he was so angry it was welling up inside him there was no empathy, there was no concern for his brother. In his mind his brother was a waste of space, it was just folly and madness for his father to even entertain him. And he wanted no part in that celebration. And we see this anger beginning to rise now in verse 28 through to 30. He became angry, was not willing to go in. His father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and he said to his father, Look, for all these years I've been serving you. I've never neglected a command of yours. And yet you've never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. You see the anger there in this older brother. He is so angry. And he just lists all of the things that his brother's done. Maybe that's a list of things that he's been bottling up, wanting to say to his father, but never had, never did. And, and out it all comes, this, this vitriolic list of things that his brother's done. He refuses to attend the celebration, even though actually the elder son had a responsibility under under really the uh, uh, Jewish uh, 
not law, but, but just the ethics and the way that society ran. He, he had a duty to attend the feast and actually to serve alongside with his father. And so, in a way, it, it, was, a, it was a real embarrassment for his father that this older son refused to go to the feast when there would have been lots of other people there. And it's actually like the behaviour of um, a teenager where they pick a fight with their parents in, in front of a, a full house, you know, just to show the parents up. I mean, that's what he's doing. I'm going to show you up before a house full of guests. And it's a way of humiliating his father. So it's, it's more than anger. There's more going on in this elder brother's mind. Notice how the father responded in verse 28. He didn't chastise him. He didn't punish him. Even though the elder son probably thought the father should be punishing the younger son you know what why are you embracing him you should be punished you should be you know disciplined but no the father came out and pleaded be, began pleading rather so that's a continuous thing he was pleading with his son now he could have ordered his son as the patriarchal head he could have ordered his son and said, get inside that house, go and do your job, stop acting like a baby. But he didn't. He allowed him to express himself and he pleaded with him. Because it was his love for his elder son. And that was no less pro profound, no less, no, no less than it was for his younger son. He loved them both equally. There was no difference. And so we have this list of complaints, which really shows contempt for his father's humility, even though his father pleaded with him. It reveals that underneath all of the outward profession, actually inside, this elder son was as much, if not worse, than his younger brother. In Jeremiah, you know it well, 17 verse 9, The heart is more deceitful than all else, is so desperately wicked, who can understand it? That's us. That's me. Wicked hearts. We can't understand them. That's why we need the Lord. You know, his rant was, I've been slaving, I obey your commands. You don't give me a feast, you know, you don't you don't have my friends round while he's off doing his own thing. You you've not treated me like this. Rather he's wasted all of his money on prostitutes. And so he attacks his younger brother and he brings up the past. And the topping or the icing on the cake was this fattened calf. He doesn't deserve it, is what the older son is saying the older son is not at this point going to accept the platitudes of his brother he's not going to accept that he's changed or that he's uh, sorry he's angry now I want you to think about this older brother as you read through his complaints is there any sympathy for this older son. Do you think he might have a point? After all, he was, this younger brother was unfaithful, where he's been faithful. The younger brother was disobedient, where he's been obedient. This older brother's been out working in the fields. Surely he's got a point. Has he? Or has he not? I think the point to remember, one of the points, is that this older son has already had his inheritance. <laughs> and more than the younger. So this whining and complaining, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. You see, in this parable, Jesus is not teaching us about being cautious or protecting our property, which of course we have to, 
we can't be unwise we have to be wise we have to be wise with our children that's not the point his lesson is this how do we respond to the father's love of sinners because the father here is responding to the younger son with great love and empathy how do we respond to sinners when they come to faith how do we respond when God shows grace and forgiveness and acceptance do, do we embrace them or do we think mm, not sure about that one not sure if they're really saved um, there can be an arrogance and uh, self-righteousness like this elder brother that we can have as believers you know to refuse those whom the father accepts is no small matter to reject a truly born again spirit filled brother or sister on the basis sometimes of past sin not not now but past it, review, it reveals really our personal skewed understanding of God and really a, a legalism that is hard and unforgiving, graceless. And really we must ask ourselves, how dare we? <laughs> how dare we question the Father's love for another human being? This elder son was questioning the Father's love. He was saying he's stupid. For having him back and he didn't want anything of it so we need to be aware that we don't become self-righteous see the elder son is now showing his true colors he's full of concern for himself he's had his share of the inheritance but he's self-centered he is judging his brother according to his own needs, his own feelings, his own concerns, and as I've said, there's no empathy. And he's now acting worse than his brother. Actually, the elder son is now in his own metaphorical pig pen. He is now with the swine. So we have to be careful. We don't want to be a younger brother running, rushing off <laughs> uh, for that dream life nor do we want to be the elder brother who relates a lot to the Pharisees in that attitude all right I'll have to speed along because I can see times rushing by all right so verse 31 and 32 as we close this is the father said to him, Son, you have always been with me. All that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Notice that he says your brother, whereas previously the elder brother had said your son. He, he wouldn't even say he was his brother. But here... The father says it's your brother. We, we've got to rejoice over this. And it, again, it's the father's appeal to the sonship. You know, to, to saying is appealing to his son, to, to the son's humanity and saying, look, show some grace here. You're always with me. You know, nothing's changed. I still love you. Everything that I have is yours you've got your inheritance there's no threats there's no chance of loss we've got to celebrate we've got to be glad I'm rejoicing because you your lost brother has come back I can't help myself we must celebrate when the sinner comes back because he was dead and is alive again that picture of resurrection recreation he's a new creation he was lost and he's found. The Father has sought him out and drawn him home. And so this is the tale of the two sons. And really Jesus shocks his audience with this parable. Because there's a role reversal. 
the the son who looks like he's the right you know he's on the right side he he's actually you know spotless perfect it actually turns out that he is at this time anyway in the parable the sinner so yes the younger son lived that reckless life he sought his own pleasure and as one uh, commentator said there is often more truth in a pig pen of consequences than in the banquet hall of revelry and it's often not until we feed in the pig pen that we can understand the glory of the father's house and that's what the son the younger son experienced but the older son is that almost religious elitist he, he's done the right thing but uh, he's disgraced his father now and he's not aligned with the thinking of the father it was mark twain who said there is a, a goodness that is not truly good and a righteousness that is not truly right and that's where this older brother was you know paul writing to the romans said own nothing to anyone except to love one another for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law forgiveness and love does not come easy for the eldest boy um, and it doesn't come easy for self-righteous christians we need to be careful that our goodness does not cloud our judgment when it comes to forgiving and showing grace. We can very easily slip into legalism. You see, our pleasing the Father, we're not trying to appease our Lord. We're not trying to win his affection. We already have it everything he has he's given us why do we serve God because of what he's already done because of his love for us the son the eldest son had lost that perspective you know I'm doing all this for you that was his attitude in first John uh, chapter 4 verse 19 to 20 John wrote we love because he first loved us if someone says I love God and hates his brother he is a liar for the one for for the one who does not love his brother whom he can see or has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen this is the commandment that we have from him that the one who loves should love also his brother so we serve out of love we conquer besetting sins, the things that have, you know, we have to deal with as we, as we as we walk in our path of sanctification. But we know as believers that God loves us. And we have this wonderful picture now in this parable of Father God, our Heavenly Father, that compassionate Father who loves both his sons equally, who gives each of them enough freedom to allow them to make their own decisions. And even when they make wrong choices, He's still there waiting. He's still there willing to receive them home. Because once a son, always a son. Remember that. Once a daughter, always a daughter. Once born again, always born again. And that gives you and I great assurance. It is a message also uh, that you are valuable to God. Even in your unbelief, you're valuable to God. You might feel worthless. Don't let that lie be sown. That is how the younger son felt. You may be self-righteous like the elder son. But again, don't let that take you over. But know this, that you are valuable in God's sight. And even when we slip up, even though our sins... Uh, put us down God's grace is bigger it's higher it's wider and his ways are not like our ways God is ready and able to receive you as a son or a daughter and if you desire a real and meaningful life not just the playboy life a real meaningful life then you will find it in Christ in God
Let me finish. You know, the twist in this parable is that each of the sons appear opposites. And yet, you dig a bit deeper, and they're both the same. And there's one thing that they both want. They both want a meaningful relationship with their father. The youngest son received that once he came to his senses, once he repented and he went home. The eldest son always had it, but didn't understand it. And so Jesus leaves the parable hanging. It's unfinished. We don't know how the eldest son responds because it's a story. But despite these differences, both sons were equally loved by the father. So, whether you find yourself in the pig pen or working in the field, it's time to come home to the Father. Amen. It's time to come home. Your Father has a banquet prepared for you. And He longs to receive you home. And to clothe you in His righteousness. To give you a new life. And His approval is simply a prayer away. So don't wait any longer. Be reconciled to God. God bless. Amen.